Podcast listener, and welcome to the D and D Minus Zone, the only chat show about a podcast by a podcast for a podcast. I think most <laughs> podcasts actually probably fit into that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. I've never introduced myself on any of these before, so I don't know why I did it now. But it's a great <laughs> way to introduce our cast: Anna Bosnick, Heath Enright, Morgan Clark, and of course. The one, the only, no illusions. Ha, ah, there are two of the rest of you guys. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do one more. Or more. There might even be three of you. There could be plenty. Yeah, we don't know. Welcome to the Dungeon Master's Corner. You guys haven't gotten a chance to be here yet, but this is the little uh, AMA corner that I've carved into the corner of the podcastiverse where I... I like it. It's not, It's it's cozy. Yeah, I've got a crackling fire and a, a flagon of mead, a typewriter. I'm not adding sound effects. That's not... There's no way that's mead. There's no way. That's some weird ass <laughs> fake got, mead shit. Of mango nectar. <laughs> Soy mead. Yeah. How many wolves do you think, werewolves do you think we could fight in this room? At least 27. In this room? All right. Oh, this is a spacious room. You could fit at least 27 werewolf fights in this tiny corner of the podcast diverse. All mm. right. So, so it's like a really big room, but we're all smushed into the corner of it. So it can be a corner. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. It's five by five in Eli's mind. <laughs> no, 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 this one, this one, five by six. Like yeah, I said, very, very spacious. Oh, yes. Very roomy. Very, very spacious. Roomy. All right. So like I said, we're going to answer some of your questions about season one of D&D Minus on this episode. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait, I thought I was getting more than one episode a month. You are correct because just two weeks from today, you will hear the very first episode of our second season, which brings me to our first question. Super Bat Phone asks, is the next season going to be D&D or some other system? Are we going to see people make new characters, etc.? How many episodes will it be? And will we get more than one episode a month? I already answered that last one. I'm very excited about the new characters. There's some new characters. I'm yes, there so are. I'm so excited about my new character. I'm specifically excited about Anna's new character. <laughs> 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 I'm excited about all of your new characters. I think it's really cool that we're going to be able to like kind of shift the party dynamic a little bit. I know that I'm not going to be keeping people alive anymore. <laughs> I yeah, can't. no, you guys are going to have to count on me for that. But, but I think what what's fun about it is that, like, I think with the exception of Heath, we'd all done you know some role playing in the past, and I know that I went into it thinking about what I'd done in terms of role playing before. This is what I want to do. It's a little different when you're doing what we're doing, right? When you're not doing role play for the purposes of a podcast. So I think. Like, I feel like we all knew a little bit more what we wanted to do specifically from an entertainment perspective going into this new season. Yeah. And I, I also think an interesting choice that almost all of you made is you all almost entirely chose to go the opposite direction of where your character was the last season. Yeah. Which I think is not just a fun thing for us to explore so we don't get bored of the same dynamic over and over again, but also really widens the world of like what this show can be and the different ways it can be funny because the truth is like we had a really fun season of Heath and Morgan you know try to kick down every door they walk past but that is not an infinite well we could go back to <laughs> I feel like Heath begs to differ but I don't know I, just, I don't want to put words in this mouth. right but I'm not going to do that <laughs> right exactly I'm yeah. not going to kick the door down but I might use my magic new sword that I have I don't want to spoil anything but like it's pretty fucking cool I have some cool swords for sure to you though <laughs> yeah you sure don't you yeah, sure I, say, I think they got taken away <laughs> one of them can like fly and it talks i think <laughs> if i remember correctly i forget spoilers. exactly but it's pretty cool spoilers wow yeah. spoilers one spoilers two i edited that to make you seem like less of a psychopath so you might want not to <laughs> <laughs> give away i have cut you down to a reasonable actor now you're gonna need to re-edit again but to answer the first question which is i think the only one that we did not answer it is going to be D D. For our second season, I would love to play other systems in future seasons, but I think for season two, at least, we're going to stick to D&D. &D. The show's called D&D &D fucking minus. Come on. We're we, right. we, we going yeah. we to play fucking vampire? D&D &D rocks. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Exactly. 
All right, second question. This was a very popular one. We got this from Taru Tikanin as well as patron Gamork, who asked if the Keith DM game is ever happening. And yes, it is definitely, definitely going to happen at some point. Woo! We just needed to get ahead far enough. When we first sort of discussed Heath doing the DM game, I was like, great. So do I just like throw you in and you learn the rules of D&D? And that was not going to be fun for anybody involved. But we've got a system that we're going to work with and, and Heath is going to do some fun stuff. And I, I think it's going to be a lot a lot of fun. It might already be happening right now. It's <laughs> happening as we speak. This is the game. Oh my God. The game is within the game. I'm going to have to saw my ankle off in order to get the key? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Anna, roll for a song. Oh my God. <laughs> That's going to be a dexterity check. Oh my God. Not strength. I think it's dexterity. For sawing your ankle off? And when you're the dungeon master, you get to decide that sawing through your own leg is a dexterity check. Constitution, <laughs> baby. It would be constitution. I feel like constitution is the right it's answer. definitely constitution yeah. rather than dexterity. <laughs> but hey, when he's the dungeon master, who knows? Wait, wait, wait. Because if it's dexterity, if it's dexterity, then you think the primary concern is that you're going to miss? Well, it'll depend <laughs> on the role. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, see? Oh, shit. Wrong ankle. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> you've, you've learned all my secrets already. Speaking of Heath, I actually wanted to get this one out of the way first because this is a question we got very commonly throughout the season. And Dion sort of put it the best here in our AMA. Dion asks, I remember Heath being fairly unruly and maybe unwilling to play in the first episodes. He turned out to be one of the best and most invested members of the group. Allegedly. <laughs> An invest he, was in, he was in the fucking top four. <laughs> he was in the top four, yeah. This is, however, my opinion and perception of things. Maybe reword that as part of the group. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong or right? And if he really got kind of drafted into D&D, &D, how did he find his role and excel in it? Okay, well, um, apparently you're wrong. You already heard that from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I got into it most because, you know, I just started to learn kind of how, how it all works. I'd never played before. And then it just got really exciting to like lean all the way into the, you know, sort of rules that I sort of knew about the universe more and more and more. <laughs> and that uh, that became a fun game within a game for sure. The bendable rules. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like the interesting thing I think that happened at the end of the season was Heath's initial kind of feeling was, oh, I'm going to do a bard next because I've heard bards are funny and fun to play and all that kind of stuff. And we ended up like switching. And I think the thing going forward for all of us is we maybe don't feel as hamstrung in this next season. We were like, we picked kind of without a bunch of knowledge going on. And we were like, okay, well, we're going to have to like excel in the character that we've chosen from the beginning. And this time we're like, I, I have a feeling now what I want to accomplish with so much more, like, you know, a foundation behind it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Excellent. Yeah. For sure. All right. So this is actually a good question. Sort of along those lines, we had a question from Arch Stanton, who said very nice things, and then asked, how does it feel to make this show versus your other shows? And if I can sort of add another question to that, Near Uncertainty asks, was anyone hesitant about putting this out as a podcast? Was there a moment or an episode where you realized this is great, this will work as part of the PIAT brand? Ooh. Okay, uh, for, for me, two moments stand out that I especially liked and remembered. One, obviously, shitting backflips. Obvious, of Just course. So yeah. very, very exciting. I also very much enjoyed the moment where there was an attempt to win some sort of boss fight with a, a WWE like top rope move. That was you. And somehow oh, that was I you. failed yeah. 19 fucking times in a row. <laughs> so many times in so a row. Times. This was the, like the only time in the entire <laughs> season where Eli was like trying to help me as best he could. <laughs> so it was like, it's like when I was in middle school and you had to do that fitness test and it was like, you know, the gym coach trying to help you do one pull up. So like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it, it went, it went, it became unfunny eventually. And then it wrapped right back around to funny again. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Disagree. It did. Funny the whole time. Yeah. Kind of like me trying to do one pull up in middle school. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I'll say, you know, to near uncertainty's question, I really needed some cajoling to, to put this out as a podcast. I didn't understand how it would be entertaining to listen to other people play D and D right. Like, like, like that, that is like in my mind when we first, when, when Eli started to pitch this, that was in my mind, the same as like listening to other people play checkers. 
right? Like, <laughs> why would that be fun to do? And I listened to some other actual play podcasts and they weren't for me. And I, I was just like, wow, this is not, you know, I don't really feel good. We're, we, you know, our, our show is, is known for activism and politics and stuff like that. And I felt like it was really like, a big departure, a much bigger departure uh, from what we normally do than than anything else that we had done in the past. I, I already felt like Citation Needle was a pretty big departure for us, so I needed some cajoling. I'm really glad we did it, though. Like you know, uh, Arch Stanton's question about how is this different? Well, Jesus, I just show up, right? Like for me, right. it's, <laughs> it's a work. I over prepare for everything, but like. This whole idea of letting Eli do all the work, that was a great fucking idea. I wish we'd had it sooner and I wish I wish that I had like uh you know signed on to it quicker. Yeah, I like that I have no idea what's coming other than spite from Eli. Like mystery yep, spite. That's, that's the only but honestly also love from Eli, right? Like it's an interesting combination of love and heavy spite at the same time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's very endearing. Well, so we don't we, I don't get the spite Heath, I don't think that's in the, in the, I don't think all of us are getting the spike. That doesn't have to be there. <laughs> Everyone had different experiences of being on the show. I, I get some spite. I feel you. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Of course, Morgan, as all of you noticed, the editing of the show got a tremendous amount better at whatever episode. And that's because Morgan now helps me with like the initial edit for the episode. So I can always tell how spiteful I've been to him by like how neatly organized the file is when he says it. <laughs> if they're all slammed into one track, I'm like, all right, I got to give Morgan a magic sword or some shit. I don't know how to fuck this up. Yeah, like I actually just binge like the whole season in like the last two weeks and some of those early episodes, I still kind of, I would like to go back and edit, but I understand <laughs> that we can't do that. But like, my whole take, you know, this show to other shows is this is the only show that I'm not behind the camera, essentially. And I always thought it was just going to be a one off. I didn't ever think it was going to become a full thing. So I was always like, yeah, I'll, I'll sit down and play D&D &D for like, you know, five hours with some friends. Like that sounded like a great idea. And then when it kind of grew into a full thing, I was a little hesitant just because I don't, you know, find myself as funny as you guys. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I could hang for longer and longer, but it's definitely been, I'm very glad that like, I'm glad we're still doing it. It's, you know, a highlight of, I guess not a month now, every, you know, twice a month. Twice a month, bi-monthly, month, mm -hmm. month by -ly. bi weekly. <laughs> All right. So we got a good question about the universe here from Tone Glauvinik. I hope that's not your real name because I just <laughs> murdered it. What character in the D&D minus universe season one do you most relate to? Mm. Oh, so spiritually, Carl, obviously, right? Of course. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, okay. Politically, uh, Tiamat, maybe? Ooh, wow. Interesting. Okay. Lots of conflicting ideas. That, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like the bad dragon heads get chopped off, I guess. I don't know. Something, something like that. I think Gary. Mm. Sure. Sure. Because uh, Gary's just trying to do his thing. He's trying to get his plan off the ground, you know? Mm. Constantly reinvented himself. What was the name of um, Heath's patron? Gladys. Gladys. The Gladys. That's who I relate to the most. Sure. <laughs> okay. Sure. All right. She's pretty great. All right. <laughs> yeah. I think I most relate to Bridget because most of my like personal life, which has nothing to do with the show, is Aww. like corralling dum dums. So like that's that's kind of who I relate sure, to. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> has nothing to do with the show. Thank you. Nothing Thank to do you with the show. show. Very <laughs> sweet of you. I promise. Present company exploded. <laughs> exploded. With yeah. Professional dum dum wrangler. I thought the audio quality we've been sending you recently has been great. <laughs> I walked into that. Yeah. No, I hundred percent did not mean that. <laughs> that's fine. I don't turn my fan off while we record. I get it. Morgan. I do. <laughs> so here's a really good one from Mockingbird Nation. What's the path not taken in the story you wish you'd gone down? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. All right. I wish that I had actually joined to one of the other characters and tried sneaking into a castle as one of those Zaphods. The Zaphods. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. I think that would have been <laughs> real fun. And by fun, I mean not fun in the moment, but fun to listen to later. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you bring up the Zaphods because there's another question in here somewhere where someone was like, what's the thing they missed that you wish they had seen? And like, I was like, well, obviously they're going to do the Zaphods. So I'll write a little <laughs> thing in case they decide they want to sneak around. But I wrote like a lot based on Zaphods. And if you listen carefully <laughs> to that arc, there are moments where people just kind of 
are places. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but Murloc <laughs> and the bad dragonborn guy, they're just like hanging out in the basement. There were reasons for that in the Zaphod plot line, <laughs> but it, we, it was fucking over, baby. I was just like, they're both there. They're both fucking there. They're, they're, they're killing Dave's <laughs> roll dice. Mom, they're killing Dave's mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when Claw just like picked up the final boss and threw him mm. in the time warp, oh. that, was, that was fantastic. Oh my God, incredible. So good. But like in retrospect, I wish we had fucked around with some like back to the future stuff with the lighthouse of time before the final thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that was like the perfect final thing. But I wish we did some like back to the future, like fuck with multiple pathways. Because I feel like, Eli, did you have ideas for that? Did you have ideas if we like made branches that we're going to mess with, with the continuum? No, I, I kept that pretty tight timeline wise. I was just going to yada, yada, yada. So, I mean, I look, I would have rolled with it as I rolled with Claw's absolutely phenomenal finale. But yeah, it was such a good finale. I was editing it because when we were doing it, I was like, oh shit, this is math. It's supposed to be the final battle. And then as I was editing it, I was like, oh my God, this is literally the perfect ending for our fucking show. Like it's the perfect. Wow. I'll never reach those heights again. I'm yeah. going to be so boring. The <laughs> fact that the official physics all checked out. <laughs> Every <laughs> single element. It's fucking amazing. We have a couple of listeners, our friend Don Ford and a couple other folks who listen to the show who I will occasionally like go to to just to make sure I'm not like really upsetting the people who know the rules of D&D &D better than me. And I was like, hey, like, did I completely blow the finale? And everyone was like, no, it actually works. It works. <laughs> I'm, I'll never recover, but it does work. You did technically follow the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> And that, of course, brings me to this question. I think this is going to be a popular one. This is don't use your good yarn on bad conspiracies asks, what was your favorite mess with the DM moment? Which antics mucked up the storyline the worst? My favorite mess with the DM moment was when we repeatedly took advantage of the fact that Eli doesn't know what size anything is in the <laughs> yes. world. <laughs> yes. I had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. I think the one that messed up the DM stuff the worst though was when Claw decided to go on some sort of like detective mission. Oh yeah. That was incredible. And split the party up. The cat litter. Yep. That was crazy. Laundry basket cat litter thing. Yeah, laundry basket yep. cat litter. <laughs> I think I think I was off the rails, but thank I you. I think it's the funniest. <laughs> Love that. People ask me like what do you think the funniest moment of the season is? And Claw slamming the laundry basket of kitty litter <laughs> on the desk is that I, I laughed so hard I would have to take breaks editing it. I think the only reason it worked though was because like the three of you were like, we have to stop him. Like <laughs> it was very much, because honestly I felt I was off the rails. Even in the moment I was kind of like, oh, like pull it back. But I don't know. I think though, it, like consistently... My favorite moments listening to the show were my least favorite moments recording mm. it. You know, sure, basically. sure. Like in the moments where you're like, oh, for fuck's sake, like during the record, when you listen back over it, it's like, oh, yeah, that, that works actually pretty well. Oh, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I liked it when we were at Snedrick's Magic University place. And so we went inside and then we just like all walked back out and started <laughs> chatting up villagers. We were flirting with security guards. I think we, we took a long walk at one point. Did take like, a long walk. You went to like buy world. a river. Yeah. yeah. No. And finally, Eli had to be like, stop having a fucking picnic with uh, grapes or whatever the fuck. I, what are you doing? <laughs> I enjoyed that was like a Zaphod mo moment too yeah. I'm sure you had yeah, ideas no, yeah. for us that weren't happening correctly I enjoyed going to the island of uh, the Animal Crossing island that was great oh that was good too yeah. yeah one of my favorite jokes in the show was when Heath's mom got captured and Noah was like oh this is a Heath problem and Heath was like this is a my mom problem and we almost like <laughs> didn't do anything I, I kind of I wonder what would have happened if we had not just abandoned <laughs> Heath's mom Heath's mom <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Okay. One eyed Nick. I signed up to knowledge fight 28th of January, 2023 as a point of reference for how far behind Dan is with these shout outs asks. That's a patron name. If you could pick any NPC from the first campaign to be your character in the second campaign, who would you pick? You can't all pick Carl. Ooh. Well, the correct answer here is obviously Gary, right? But, um, <laughs> ooh. I mean, Gary's great, but he can't focus on one thing. 
Oh, whatever could we do if we had a character <laughs> we couldn't focus on one, one thing? How in the world could we venture in such circumstances? Our party needed so much goddamn Adderall that we didn't have. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ADHD and D is what we needed. <laughs> I would love to play Greg, the good gang member. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just like a beast who has like zero intelligence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ooh, Wool Dasher Mizzle. What about, didn't we? Ooh, yeah, sure. He popped out of the stuffed dragon and he helped us. He's an NPC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I thought, like I said, I thought Gary was the objectively correct answer, but I think I would have gone with Athiana. Was that her name? Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, Holly. Holly Crinkles. That's, yeah. Holly Crinkles. Yeah. yeah. Athiana was the name of the place. That's right. Yeah. Holly Crinkles. I enjoyed a beach also. Did you? A beach Slutsky? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was a good foil. Really? A good foil. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to play him. Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe Heath would want to play him. I don't know. <laughs> beach had some good magic. Yeah. No, he, he did. did. It's true. Yep. Yep. It's true. Yeah. You would play the inconceivable guy from the fucking Princess Diary, too. <laughs> Princess Bride. Princess Bride. Princess Diary. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a good question from Detective Matthew Maxson. Detective Maxson asks, who do you feel has grown the most in understanding D&D &D and playing a character? And Kelly Burke, shout out to Kelly Burke, by the way. Kelly made our D&D &D minus trivia for our pajama party live stream this oh, year. So good. So huge thanks to Kelly for doing that. But to add on to the question, Kelly asks, for those new to D&D, &D, what were your favorite and least favorite parts of learning to play? So what was the first question? Who do you feel has grown the most in understanding D&D &D and playing a character? Well, it's obviously mm. Heath. Like, there's a correct answer to that. <laughs> there was, there was a, I'm the only one who know, started at zero, so I well, had right, yeah. well, an unfair advantage. And at some point, you surpassed my understanding because like, there was just one week where suddenly you were just like, well, actually, no, my bonus action has a key point and a blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, what? Oh, fuck, <laughs> Jesus, no. Now I'm the... Because, like, like I'm not new to D&D, &D, but the last time I played before this, I'd, I'd done some different tabletop RPGs, but the last time I played D&D, &D, like, people in the know were still calling it a D and d Sure. Right? So, like, <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. I, I might as well have been brand new to it. So, to answer Kelly's question, my favorite aspect of learning it was seeing how good Eli was at jujitsuing Heath's attempts to <laughs> derail the game. <laughs> But because what that means is that over the whatever 50, 49 years or whatever the TNTs have been around, a bunch of fucking Heaths did the same fucking thing and forced <laughs> him to make a rule against it. And then some Heath at some point did it to Eli and forced him to learn that rule. Right? <laughs> like it was, so it was like seeing Heath go up against a master of pedantry, or, or I'm sorry, like 50 years of pedantry masters. It was like, that was a ton of fun. Yeah, short of like biblical numerology, I don't think you can find a better system of nerds who have focused on the yeah. details. <laughs> right. And D&D &D is useful. So, you know, there's a major. <laughs> also, credit to. Don Ford, voice of fantasy and adventure for helping me learn at one point. I think it was right after we got our old characters and the character sheet got way bigger and we had way more spells, way more powerful, mm. way more interesting things we could do. He gave me like a three week seminar on how to play <laughs> the game and that character. So helpful. So I love you, Don. Don, it's your turn to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Both Don and Alex Cloud, incredibly, incredibly helpful. Last season, super helpful in people picking and building characters this season. Again, just cannot thank them enough. Yeah. Also, can I give a big thanks to Alex, too, for helping me mm. out? When we were in Detroit, we saw him mm -hmm. and he was helping me out with like, oh, build this new character. And we were talking about the bard thing. Uh, spoiler, I end up not being a bard, but he gave me a whole bunch of like useful advice on like how to craft a character. It was, it was super good. Super good stuff. Yeah, I, I talked to him at the live show for a while, too, and he, he just like presented me with like three quick ideas and I was like, yeah, all of those are brilliant. We have to do all those. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when I was exploring virtual tabletops, because I, I was preparing for the season and I was like, hey, you know, we did a lot of like which guy or there must be an angle which. So I bought and or took lessons in every virtual tabletop that is for sale. <laughs> and we ended up going theater of the mind. I think we're going to stay theater in the mind. Just no, they all sort of ended up being a little too computer gamey for what we want to do. But 
Alex actually walked me through the system that he uses when he plays with people online. And if I were one one hundredth as smart as Alex is at anything, I absolutely would have used his system. He was just like, yeah, no, it's just a simple, you do the diagonal hexagon. And I was like, you've lost me, Alex. You've lost me <laughs> forever. But yeah, huge, huge thanks to all of them. Speaking of which... Jay asks, who do I have to blow to get a spot on the cast? Jay, my wife is on the show, so you know the answer. That would be Eli. <laughs> Thank you. My thought is you just start blowing people and you find out. <laughs> start like blowing the cast. Just yeah, and sure. Go in, like, when you're on the show. Alphabetical? Or, you'll know. No, reverse alphabetical order. <laughs> Another one from that super long patron name, Eli. What was your favorite arc to write and why? Uh, I have to say, gosh, that is tough, but I'm going to go with probably the Tomb of the Undying Nation. So for the D&D nerds in the audience will already know this, but that is Akarak and all, all that, like the, the lich and a lot of the plot and a lot of the traps that you saw in that arc are from a very old module called the Tomb of Annihilation, which was famously difficult, right? The, the whole thing was like, bring five character sheets to the table because that's enough to get you started, right? It was the idea that like, this was a, a tomb full of traps and deadly monsters that was going to absolutely wipe your characters out no matter how high level they were. And I loved the idea of running that. I don't particularly like to kill player characters, right? I don't mind it. I'm not against it. I'm certainly for it. I would happily kill any of the characters in any of our games, much as we joke. About happily? You'd happily kill us any day. Happily? <laughs> I mean, I would not happily. I would, I would definitely kill a player character if it was dramatically fitting for the arc. But I just didn't like the idea of exposing our cast to it because they're so new and Tomb of Annihilation is like famously unfair. And so I was inspired by Griffin McElroy. They ran as a live show, The Tomb of Annihilation. They, they ran just the beginning of it. All of them die. And this was like with their very beloved characters. And then it turns out they're in a video game. And I thought, oh my gosh, like a, a way for you to die where you're not really dying. And so that's where the idea of the undying nation came from. And that sort of span out into the character and the larger writing I did for that arc. And yeah, I was, I was super duper pleased with Everything from the fucking Amelius Bedelius room to just the the traps and the the city they got to explore. I thought that was one of the best fleshed out cities with with a lot of fun for them to interact with there. So yeah, I I, I loved that one. But enough about me. Let's hear, have a question from Bird Lawyer Esquire. Looking back over the whole season, would you have chosen different starting character builds? I feel like this answer is yes for at least one of you. Are you talking about me? <laughs> No, I was talking about Morgan, who oh. brilliantly decided to play a rogue, even though he was cast as a monk. <laughs> I mean, I would actually say, no, I would keep the same character because I just decided early to like try one thing and kind of keep that as a character trait. So I would have stuck with the same character. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Really? All right. I'm much happier, like, you know, creating a new character from scratch with the kind of everything I learned, but I'm glad I played through the character that I had. All right. I'll say it was the first time that I ever played a cleric. Mm -hmm. And I've played a bunch of different kinds of roles. And uh, I tend to like to be like a barbarian or a fighter or something where they can like just run in and hack shit up. But it was nice to... And I've, I've played a warlock and a few magic users. But I, I was nice to be the one who kind of had to sit back. I had a lot of cool shit I could do, but I couldn't always do it because I always had to save my actions for who's going to need my help the most mm -hmm. and like really, really get it party focused as opposed to like center focused. Mm -hmm. For me, in terms of spell casting, I would have done something a little different. Instead of the like powerful attack spells like fireball, very useful, got to do some cool stuff with fireballs and the necklace of fireballs is awesome. But I think I'd go for more spells that like interact with enemies or like mess with the physics of the universe, do do weird stuff. Did you cast spells? Yeah, fireballs. <laughs> Did you? Eldritch Blast is the name of one, I'm pretty sure. A lot mm -hmm. of Eldritch Blast. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sure. So, okay, when we got, my, one of my favorite moments, when we got to mind control the Donald Trump eyeball mm. and, and we got to hear Eli singing as Donald Trump, that was one of my favorite moments. <laughs> I had a bunch of, I, I kept putting a bunch of spells in that mess with the physics, thinking, oh, this will be, I'll find some clever way to use it. And I couldn't ever find a way to use it. And then I was just like, I wish I just had a fucking Eldritch Blast, you know, or, or something like that. 
that was just because like the attacks were the only things that were consistently useful within the game. Constantly, I was just like, oh, man, if we ever come across a room full of zombies, I'm going to be able to <laughs> handle this sure will be funny. But then it never, you know, just never worked out. So sure. maybe I'm just not creative enough. That's that's possible. Too. <laughs> well, I know that there is a thing that you always want to do where you're like, oh, I need to do something new this time. I don't want to keep on doing the same like spell over and over again. But I have a theory that it is there are no boring spells there are only boring one-liners. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think we all kind of like <laughs> upped our game in like creating new ways to do the same old shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? For sure. Hey, you know what, Anna? I, I've done 520 some uh, diatribes at this point. Yes. I, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. Kind of our thing. Another character-related question from Sean here. A powerful magician has swapped your character's bodies. In order of fastest to slowest... Who checks out their new body's junk first? One hundred percent, Bridget. <laughs> oh, interesting. interesting. Okay, she's the only one who has like mm. totally different junk. Oh wait, what, no, the, no, no. Claw's got a fucking say, cloaca. Yeah, okay, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say whoever becomes Claw is definitely checking first. Yeah, sure. And then the the rest of us right after that, I guess. <laughs> well, like Snedrick's hanging uh, like fucking in the breeze every time he summons the asshole. So there's no oh, curiosity. Yeah, there. we've seen it. That's yeah, like, yeah. That's yeah. like wondering what Eli's junk looks like after a live show. Yeah, the exact same thing. <laughs> okay, but pretty much all of us right away, right? Because like, if no matter what, if you're in a magical body switch scenario, first thing you're doing is like, okay, what's going on there? Right? That is not the first thing I'm doing. No. That is not the first thing I'm doing. That's crazy. I would be really kind of weirded out by that for a while. Like unless would, unless I'm a duck. I would probably yeah, right. If I had a cloaca and a corkscrew penis, maybe. But like if I if, if suddenly Heath, you and I freaky Friday, I would like piss with my hands behind my head the first time or something and like look up. I would just be that'd be too fucking weird. Yeah. Cause it'd be it'd be like a sexual thing between us. <laughs> See, now that you've already made it weird. We've been switched See, bodies yes. for zero seconds. And you're like, <laughs> technically, you're touching my dick just now. Just so you know. I have a question, though. If you body swap and then masturbate, are you having sex with the other person? Right, exactly. <laughs> so many weird fucking things that you have to deal with now. Yeah. Interesting. My goodness. All right. A slightly easier one. Also from Sham Hunter. Quick. One must die so the others can live and save the day. The team must decide on one party member who can put up enough of a fight to distract a powerful foe whilst the rest sneak around for some rear action and take the enemy from behind. Caliente. Unfortunately, <laughs> the chosen party member will lose in spectacular fashion and die horribly. Carl the Pug of Pegagorn. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. No, it's Dave. It's yeah, Dave. I'd like to gerrymander some <laughs> districts before we start to vote. Yeah, 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 this was, I, yeah, I was like, Dave. here's a quick in-between question. <laughs> yeah. I think Carl's actually the best answer because then you get a weird thing for Dave. Carl's not a party member, though. That's yeah, not Carl's not a party member. Mm-hmm. He's pretty or close. was he the heart and soul mm-hmm. of the party? It doesn't matter mm-hmm. if he's the heart and soul. He wasn't a party member. A party <laughs> member is a character with a yeah. Like that with a with a person playing as a non NPC character. That's just the definition. So that is fair. I, like, let's not try to cheat our way out of Sham Hunter's question. We would have sacrificed Dave. <laughs> it's nothing against yeah. Heath. It's something against Dave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. Exactly. All right, Jason's got a question for me here. As DM, what was the most frustrating puzzle that the group failed to solve without help? And Jason actually guessed it in their question. It was. When you had to go underwater and you had the underwater <laughs> breathing potions and you guys were just like, well, this is fucking wrong. Like there's no <laughs> possible. You might as well have been twiddling it amongst your fingers. <laughs> to, to be fair, only one of us had underwater breathing mm-hmm. potion. That's true. That's, that's the true. rest yep. of us had no way of knowing what was supposed to be going on there. <laughs> that is fair. All right. Great question here from the super duper long patron name again. What is your character's perfect? Sunday. Ooh. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say long brunch for sure, right? Ooh, sure. Just because it's nice. Uh, crossword puzzle. New York Times crossword Sunday. Sure. He's got a little trick in it. Mm-hmm. Bigger one. Uh, Fantasy New York Times. Yeah. Just you or, or your character? Here. I was going to say, <laughs> you know, yes. okay, there we go. <laughs> yes. And ballroom dancing. Done. Nice. Ballroom yeah, Dave's, dancing. Dave seems like the ballroom dancing type. Does seem like ballroom dancing type. I would say getting lost in a field of snog Spain and having to smoke his way out. So Ooh. I also would be the same. My name yeah, my I was say, yeah. would also be the same. 
think we were typecast a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think Bridget would take the extra coins from her tip jar, go down to Gary's casino and like just like hang out at a slot machine with like the free margaritas coming over and over and over again for like <laughs> and just listen to like the jazz concert that's happening. Fuck yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Again, going like specifically Claw, not me. I think that Claw would like spend it with his sister since he was away for so long and like hadn't seen family in you know, for a long time. Sure. That's so cute. Okay. What about you in real life? Oh, uh, I have no idea. Not Probably spending with dancing. your sister. Not being asked that question on a recording that is going to go out to yeah. people. <laughs> All right. Super duper long name. One other question. What can I say? They keep asking great questions. Do you have any magical items you wanted but never got to use? Uh, a fucking blunderbuss that works. <laughs> okay. Thoughts and prayers. The brass knuckles. Oh, mm. sure. That's just great. I uh, Yeah. I might get those tattooed. <laughs> 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 this is fantastic right here. We're having a fun, good We're having time. A love this. Great joke. Good time. Great time. Hey, Bill Dowling asks, when will there be $10 patron shout-outs with two shows a month? I can't afford this for long. Bill and anyone else who didn't get their shout-out, if you didn't get it, let me know because I have already done the $10 patron shout-outs. Here's the thing, and this applies across all of our shows if you're a patron. If anything goes wrong with your Patreon account, Patreon kicks you off of the rewards list and I don't find out about it, right? They're just like, hey, we found the scammer. We'll throw him out the front door while you're not looking. So if you didn't get your shout out, let me know. I will happily fulfill that before we start the second season or at least sometime, depending on how many yeah, of you really there hard. are. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say <laughs> at some point into the second season thing. And here's a question for you, the performers. This is from Elon, not the Musk guy. What movie or TV show would you like to see as the basis for a role-playing game? <laughs> oh, mm. good question. Oh, I like the DC universe because it's just insane. But I'm going to say even better, Fast and the Furious. Just <laughs> oh, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. That's excellent. a really good answer. This universe has devolved into complete fucking nonsense, and it's the greatest. I really think... We could have fun in that universe. Now, is it like the Cars universe where you play as a car or is it you are the driver <laughs> of a car? Um, I, Morgan, think about the movies. Are Fast no. and Furious movies about the car? No, 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 no. I want the answer. Heath, go. So great question. And I think it's both, Morgan. I think you can be a human. You can be a car. Okay. You're immortal, which is cool. And there's just a lot going on in that magic universe now, too. You can go to space. You could be a submarine. Yeah. You could be a fucking astronaut, Hyundai. Yeah. It's amazing. You could be Charlize Theron yeah. and kill your dad. <laughs> but is it like when you die, you like can't play for like a movie? You have to like wait until like a movie passes. Right, and then you right. You have to back. wait yeah. until like three, three yeah. sequels down the road. <laughs> okay, but the thing is, you didn't die, though. Yeah, yeah true, right. true. Oh, yep. That's true. Mm. So I'm going to cheat because this isn't a movie or a TV show. It's a book, but I, an RPG, a tabletop RPG based on the world of Snow Crash and uh, Diamond Age mm. by Neil Stevenson. That could be fucking amazing. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I'd, have, I'd have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, there is a, what's the one that's the worst version of Snow Crash? I would say Golden Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Golden Girls was nothing like Snow Crash. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I would actually go with Avatar The Last Airbender. I think that Ooh. would be a very... Oh, that could be fun. Because, f- I mean, you do... It's, you have like the kind of class system as well where you get, you know, four different types of characters, but I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. That must already exist, right? Probably, yeah. Yeah. yeah that might already exist. Okay, I'm changing my answer from Golden Girls to Bob's Burgers. I think mm. that could be an amazing... <laughs> Interesting. Like, just like a street gang from like mm-hmm. like a kid's street gang from like bike gang. Yeah. Ooh, I like us being in the universe of running a restaurant. Like we're yeah, all running like front a of the house, back of the house. Yeah. But like being the kids and trying to get away with doing shit around your parents who are stressed and trying to do the, the restaurant thing. So if we are Bob, based on our D&D characters, which mm. of us are which kids? Ooh, great question. great question. Heath is Louise. Yes, Heath is definitely is he Louise? Louise. That's that's accurate. Okay. Chaotic. Yeah. <gasps> oh my God, I'm Tina. Yeah, you're yep. Tina. Bridget's Tina. I'm 100% Tina. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. The best. I could be Jean. I like Jean. I don't know how this is possible, but I am Bob somehow. Yeah. <laughs> that means that Noah is Linda. <laughs> Noah's Linda. I see yeah, it. Yeah, honestly, I, I see honestly it. see that. That's really good. Yeah, the, the odd voice out, the positivity. I, yeah, mm-hmm. I know it makes sense. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, me and positivity. Those are two. Those are two words that go great. Together. I edited it. You seem very positive in the season. Oh. I promise. <laughs> All right, let's get into some controversy. That's right. Some of the controversies of the season. I'll start out with a disappointing one. Dominic, aka Kethelaton, asks at the end of episode one in the post credits. Noah says something that Eli bleeped out. That's about a whole four seconds long, and it shocks everyone. What do I need to pay to hear it uncensored? And I do want to spoil it. He didn't say anything like terrible or particularly egregious. I just had a really long censored over him saying like fuck or kill a Supreme Court justice or something. But I just didn't want people to think there was like a secret extra hard swearing behind the <laughs> scenes. No, it was it was Heath's real name and Heath's name is a slur. So we didn't think it was appropriate. That's true. That's what we use. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's fair. I always thought it was weird they named him Mick Mickerson, but you know what? I have never... <laughs> Dory, Heath, I'll, I'll beep that out so the listeners can't hear it. All right, moving on. Because you don't want to dox me, but not because it's a slur. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. <laughs> moving on to more controversy. Rachel, hard last name to pronounce, says... Adam Chick. I love the show, but I am dying to know what Eli was thinking about when he said Dave couldn't throw a javelin. <laughs> Look, I've had a lot of time to reflect on this, and I stand by my position. No. It is physically impossible <laughs> oh to throw God. a javelin. No one's ever done it. <sighs> what? Okay, to be clear, the, the question was, is it easier to throw a snorkel for long distance by just throwing the snorkel, or if you wrap it around a javelin that you also have and then throw the two together, would that be better in terms of distance throwing? Yes. And it's so clearly... The, yes, the javelin. The javelin would go further. hundred you know, percent. Throw a javelin. Now, the correct answer from Eli is, yes, it would have gone further, but tying it to the javelin would count as your action. Yeah. And mm. therefore, this would take two actions. But yeah, yeah. No, it definitely wasn't. In that moment, Eli claimed that it wouldn't go further. No, I know. I, uh, he, he, <laughs> I, he absolutely did. I had no means uh, mean to defend his take on this. I'm just saying. <laughs> By the way, we're working on a real life physical challenge of this, of throwing the snorkel and then doing Good. the javelin and the Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe at like the Thank PJ God. party next year as like an event, a physical challenge. It should have happened at this one. Why didn't it? Well, you skipped. You skipped. <laughs> yeah. you, you left us, How Morgan. Where, do you, where that, do you man? think we're throwing the javelin? <laughs> <laughs> Get it together. Couple of related questions here. Arch Stanton asks, how much do you take into account the fact that you're making a show versus regular DM prep? And James asks, I recently started playing D&D &D and I'm curious how long it takes Eli to put together each session and how long sessions usually last. So yeah, this is totally different than usual DM prep. Like Noah has referenced and said on other Q&As, like tabletop D&D &D is like kind of creating a board game for other people to play, right? It's in this room, there's two skeletons and a monkey with a sword. And in that room, there's a dragon. And in this room, there's this. And so theater of the mind means you have to throw a lot of that skill set out and start thinking in terms of like improv comedy setups. Um, so that's <laughs> what I tend to think of most is like, how can I set them up to be in the best possible position to do the most interesting thing. What's the most interesting scenario? Honestly, two skeletons and a monkey with a sword probably doesn't. I <laughs> that's that's so, you know, solid. <laughs> listen for it in season two. And yeah, as far as the time it takes to put together the session, it's it's interesting. It's really hard for me to think of it that way because I get an idea for this season. So I've been working on season two now for like ah six or seven months, right? And but I just sort of write it in my free time, right? And it sort of fills in as I get bored. I'll be like, oh, I want to jump over to three arcs from now and play with this or, ooh, I've got a really good idea from that. But then when it comes to actually like solidifying the session, I have like a couple of talking points, the combat encounters I've always planned out. And then I just sort of let them decide where the arc of the episode goes. And as far as the length of episodes, we usually record for about two hours. And those end up being 45 to 50 minute episodes. Which is very different from playing D&D &D with your friends. Right. In my experience, which yeah. is usually like four hours at a time. Right. Oh, that's normally yeah. like a four to 
five, six hour thing you, when you yeah. sit down and play in person? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get snacks and. You get snacks, you order soda. takeout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I want to do You that get now. a little too drunk to like make good decisions by the end. Well, if if we can get Morgan to the next pajama party, like all, mm-hmm. all of us do in a, a more structured, normal D&D, like a one off, like five hour campaign or something, that would be mm-hmm. a ton of fucking fun. Oh, yeah. Super fun. Hell yeah. Snacks? We can get some sweet snacks for that, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then we can order food. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Which That actually leads really well into Tara's next question, which is when do you think you'll have time to play the Christian role-playing game that you've got? So here's the thing about that system. That system is basically a ripoff of D&D 2. Oh, God. Mm. Right, the second edition of D&D 2, which is incredibly difficult to play so I have modded 5th edition out, and for a future bonus episode, we will be playing my version of that Christian role-playing game <laughs> rather than that system. That's amazing. And another teaser for a future bonus episode, though we've already recorded one of them, I'm very excited about. We were talking about this actually at the Pajama Party. There is a game called Dread that uses Jenga towers rather than dice as the mechanic for if your character succeeds or fails. That's Fantastic. I'm so excited. Over the course of the pajama party, we managed to talk through an idea for a left behind themed bonus episode using that. I'm so excited. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, well, we we, we might have to get on video for that one. That's how how excited I am about that particular one. (laughs) All right. Here's a question from Kevin. What has been your favorite moment and or the biggest surprise you had playing up till this point? I mean, the the backflip was my favorite. Like that was the great right moment. <laughs> sure, my, yeah. It was the top moment of my role playing game life, right there. Sure. Oh gosh. Followed closely by Claw's triumphant ending. That was fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that was real good. Oh, okay. When Morgan hit a five percent chance of ruining Eli's hologram thing. Oh God, oh, yes. yes. And I got so fucking angry about the concept <laughs> of one out of twenty being something that can happen. So good. <laughs> Oh God. Uh, God! Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, the darkest timeline, triggering moment. But. Oh God! I gotta say, I think when we pile drived like the nerd bro, the not the nerd bro, that the red dragon, the, the aspect oh, of the red yeah. dragon, when he turned all like crypto alt right, <laughs> and then Noah just like I think a duck came out of the ground, like shook the ground and like woke up the ground and like yes, ate and him. Ate earthquake. Him, yes, earthquake. Yeah, yeah. earthquake. Yes, that was. Oh him. God, that was beautiful. I really enjoyed the turnbuckle moment where it was like, yes. you know, we, Heath could not hit the dice. I think that was like <laughs> soon after we stopped rolling physical dice where no one could see them. And it like really paid off. That <laughs> 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 All right. Jennifer Eckert asks, what was your favorite aspect of each of your characters? So I'll say uh, in, in all seriousness, as weird as this is going to sound, his accent. Right, like I, I feel like mm. most people only ever use a southern accent to denote stupid. That's something I'm guilty of quite a bit myself. And like you know, on behalf of my wife, it's it's kind of like you know, that's people people who grow up down south have southern accents. It was it was just nice to bring a southern accent to a smart character. I thought mm. nice. Mm-hmm. I appreciated how Bridget eventually just like I loved the moments where they've been like. The you know exactly who Claw and and Dave had been fucking with me long enough that I just was like okay well I'm just gonna I am just gonna do my own thing I it was fun to listen to I will say that Mm -hmm. but I also I also liked the the backstory stuff that I came up with like her affection for alcohol and brewing spirits and beer and I liked that oh an excellent intro to the next question Julie Lavoice asks every character and every NPC had excellent backstories. How did you come up with your backstory? So uh, excellent intro, Anna. Thank you for that. Well, I came up with it because I liked the, I thought this would come up a little bit more in the thing, honestly, because I was like, I definitely might've been pirates. She's like, she's a sailor. So uh, I was like, and it definitely might've been a, a ship with pirates on it. And she would all be say, allegedly, allegedly it was pirates, allegedly. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I that's, that's kind of how I came up with it because I, I saw the background for Taylor. And I like the idea of her saying allegedly. <laughs> and then it blossomed into something totally different. <laughs> I will say that like I actually didn't come up with my backstory. I when I originally thought this was going to be just like a couple of quick recordings, I was like, you know, Eli just roll me random roll me a character. And he ran he rolled me a, a bird monk that had been like, you know, captured or whatever. And so tying into actually the last question about 
you know, what kind of aspect of your character did you like? I liked playing a chaotic character. I've never really, you know, played that sort of just chaotic, good type of alignment. And I, I leaned into it early and then I, I kept it up throughout. And like, that was the most fun part of it was, okay, I'm in this situation. What would a chaotic good character do? So cool. I liked something that actually got added to the character. I didn't have anything to do with this. Whoever came up with it was great. I don't know if it, Eli or you in collaboration with somebody, the idea I had, so I enjoyed very much my relationship, of course, with Carl the Pug at Pegacorn. <laughs> and whoever added the thing where I just got fucked with every single time it went badly with Carl. <laughs> I don't remember even like one of them was I just like blew up like a balloon, like Willy Wonka, <laughs> wh- whatever. That giant table of, I think, 10,000 or something like that. Very much enjoyed that. Yeah, the bizarre magic effects. That was me, by the way. I don't know. I don't know. I just feel really my ego is forcing me to say that I wrote the entire campaign. I don't know why <laughs> Keith said sentences just now that sound like that's not the case, but it is. Are you going to keep the 10,000 thing? Are we going to have it back? Ooh, you know what? There are lots of uses for the bizarre magic effects table. So, uh, yeah. That's a good threat to sort of just have out there, right? Like- <laughs> I'm just saying somewhere in my notes, I've got a bizarre magic effects table. What are the chances that one of us turns into a falcon again? One in 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that, was that the how I turned into a falcon the first time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because then there was another time that I think was not. You, yeah, that, that was Amelia you Bedelia. that you chose that to be a you. falcon that time. You yeah, we turned each other into falcons. Carl and turned into a falcon, and then you used your wish to turn yourself into a falcon again. Oh, yeah. That was sweet. That was sweet. That was pretty good. Yeah. Just flying <laughs> fast. Good times. By the way, just a quick note on that mechanic. So most like bizarre magic things uh, or wild magic surges is what that table is called. Those are usually supposed to be permanent. So a great thing for your game, because people are always like, oh man, like how did that work out? Like a great thing for your game is just be like, and at sunrise, it stops happening, right? And then you can do all the wacky, fun, terrible stuff that D&D has built into its systems, but sort of pad it out for beginner players or people who might not necessarily want to live with those consequences for forever. You can say idiots and say my name. You don't have to like do a long, drawn out euphemism for me being stupid. It's fine. I feel like it did. <laughs> Speaking of me writing the campaign that I wrote, that I wrote entirely by myself on my own in all possible ways that I wrote. Too far. Eli, do you write a lot of the ads on the shows? Is that something that's also true? I also, I don't know if you guys know, I also handle an occasional ad over here. You inferred that I, that someone besides, I, it's fine. It's fine. The vibes are normal (laughs) and chill. It's a cool, chill feeling I'm creating right now (laughs) with this question I'm answering. Go. (laughs) Stone Banana asks, (laughs) Stone Banana asks, when did you decide how you would end the campaign the way you did and what were some of your inspirations? And Sterling sort of beats me to the punch and asks, how happy was Eli to get his own endgame finale? And yeah, that's it. It's just Endgame, right? I just wanted Endgame. I love Endgame, as my wife can attest. I watch the Endgame finale of everyone walking through the portal on a pretty, on a too regular basis, right? Whatever you're picturing, how often I watch that <laughs> to just feel better, it's, I do it more. I do it more often and than, than probably I should. It should be discussed with a medical professional. But yeah, I, I love those sort of endgame finale things. It has sort of always been the hallmark of my favorite campaigns. Balance ends that way. Fantasy High Season 1 ends that way. I, I think if you create a robust enough world, the sort of ultimate callback that you can do is to bring that world together in its finale in a way that is satisfying and interesting to your players. Speaking of finales, I think we've got just one question left. Zach asks, now I will point out that as Anna has advocated, we may do a bonus episode with these characters. So try not to write out that possibility. But Zach asks, can we get an epilogue for each player character? Bridget Boulderstash started Open Fantasy Mike Knight at, what was the name of the bar again? Squeaky Wheel. At the Squeaky Wheel. And took up voice lessons when she realized that she was not, in fact, a great singer. (laughs) Dave, 
went on to start up a D and D group at the Squeaky Wheel, just hanging Ooh. out, playing live, you know, right over the table. Meta. Good for you get snacks. You play for like five so hours. Wait, like house houses and humans. Then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. No, it was we all would we would role play as a uh, hu- as podcasters in uh, twenty twenty three. It's an awesome universe to do that. And uh, well, that's true. Yeah, no, that that is like weirder than anything Eli <laughs> came up with. Sure, Dave was. Uh, the, the DM and learn some valuable lessons about uh, how that all works. Okay. <laughs> Snedrick returned to the land of wherever it was that he was from, I forget, where ultimately they had legalized recreational snog Spain. Uh, so he opened himself a dispensary. He worked there for many years and he died at the ripe old age of 420 <laughs> after getting lost in a field of snog Spain and trying to smoke his way out. <laughs> Claw finally returned home after his long exile away, and he could be seen in the kitchens interviewing the cook as his alter ego, Chuck Slarky. Oh, Chuck <laughs> Slarky! <laughs> oh. All right, thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you in season two, two episodes a month. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.